so maybe welcome back uh, to this uh, session. So just uh, I'll let you know that uh, the recording and live streaming has already started. And to remind you that we are bound by the IACR uh, code of conduct, which uh, among other things means that you need to change your uh, name to your full professional name. Um, and this session is on proofs and arguments, and I hand you to uh, uh, Carla, uh, the moderator of the session. Hello. Um, hello, everybody. Welcome to this session. Um, We're going to start with uh, this, um, this talk on lattice-based cryptography um, by Carson Baum and Ariel Nov. Um, Carson will, um, from Aarhus University and Ariel from um, Technion. And um, Carson will be giving the talk. The talk is called Concretely Efficient Zero Knowledge Arguments for Arithmetic Circuits and Their Application to Lattice Based Cryptography. So, welcome everybody. Um, Carson, you can start. Okay. Uh, thanks for the introduction, Carla. Um, yeah, hi, this is a joint work with Arjanov from uh, the Technion. And uh, just to clarify, so we both uh, did this work while still working at Barilan University. As I'm uh, the first one uh, in this session to talk about uh, to talk about zero knowledge arguments or zero knowledge proofs, let me just, uh, as a quick recap, say what was that again? So, in a zero knowledge argument of knowledge, we have a prover and a verifier, and uh, both of them have a statement. The prover claims that the statement is true, and they run an interactive protocol, uh, and this uh, should uh, convince the verifier that the statement is true. Uh, or not. So at the end of the interaction, the, the verifier will say accept or reject. And we have three requirements, uh, namely completeness, meaning if the statement is true and the prover has a witness, then uh, this will always finish and the verifier will always accept. Uh, knowledge soundness, meaning that uh, if, if the prover makes the verifier accept with a high enough probability, then we can always uh, ex ex extract the witness for the statement from the prover and zero knowledge meaning that a verifier could simulate uh, a, a, an accepting statement uh, without uh, any access to, um, to an actual witness. Um, and in our case, uh, we will have that this statement is encoded by a circuit over, uh, over a field and the, witness, the prover has a witness W and it wants to convince the verifier that C applied to W equals Y. And uh, this is an argument of knowledge because the prover is computationally bounded. Uh, just to, uh, to uh, state our results. Uh, so our result is a new zero knowledge argument of knowledge protocol, which is based on the MPC in the head technique. Uh, more concretely, we don't have a result that is succinct. So uh, our uh, proof size is not sublinear in the size of the circuit as it is for others. For example, for, uh, for Ligero, but our construction is concretely uh, efficient in the sense that it has really, really small uh, computable constants. And also uh, it's only based on symmetric key primitives as many other MPC in the head protocols and therefore is plausibly post-quantum secure. Uh, furthermore, what we show in our work is that it has interesting applications to lattice-based cryptography. Namely, uh, we, give a, uh, we, we give a concrete instantiation for a protocol to prove knowledge of a sort integer solution uh, a witness uh, which has low prover time and a moderate proof size over the state of the art. So our new zero knowledge argument of knowledge uh, improves upon the previous work of uh, Katz et al on MPC in the head with preprocessing. Pre um, their solution uh, uses a so-called sacrificing based approach for the, the MPC in the head in order to generate the preprocessing. And uh, we had a closer look at how uh, at, at other MPC schemes and other MPC solutions for preprocessing, and uh, we we used for the sacrificing approach. So they use cut and choose, and and we use a so-called uh, sacrificing approach instead. And uh, we use an MPC protocol that has this one as majority. Um, so uh, this was majority of parties can be corrupted, and it gives us free linear operations. So in our proof, we don't pay for uh, for linear operations in the circuit, we only pay for the nonlinear operations. And the sacrificing based approach in particular has uh, benefits when talking about large fields. 
cut and choose uh, has better performance when we talk about bits, but if we want to do uh, proof statements for uh, SIS, which is normally for Q with a large, uh, with, with a lot of bits of size, then this uh, has its benefits of heating sacrificing. And for our application to that space cryptography, uh, we, we use the observation that um, if we, for example, want to prove that we know an S such that A times S is T, which is uh, standard in, uh, which is so-called SIS instance uh, where T and A are public, then uh, normally this consists of two steps, multiplying S with A and then proving that S is small. And here we can harness that, um, uh, that the multiplication with A comes for free because linear operations are for free. Uh, our uh, proof technique uh, uses that the prover and the verifier uh, can choose the circuit together, which allows us to uh, lower the overall circuit size uh, for, the, for the statement that is proven. So this gives us better com uh, communication complexity. And in particular, we, for example, show how to use rejection sampling inside uh, our zero knowledge argument of knowledge. And that's cool on its own. And I'm happy to take questions. Uh, Carla, I can't hear you. You're on silent. Sorry. Um, <laughs> thank you, Kristen. Um, I, um, I don't see any raised hands. Um, any, I don't see any, any questions. Do you? No? Um, I, no, I, I don't, don't see it either. Yeah. Okay. Um, maybe I, I have a question. So you, mm -hmm. You choose to to base your your argument on this MPC on in the head paradigm. paradigm. Mm -hmm. um, what about other approaches that, uh, for instance, um, this um, let this proof that um, tries to generalize this argument in the discrete log setting of Boutelotal? So, what do you expect um, will be the comparison? So, so the, 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 there is the solution by Boodle et al. Uh, from last year's PKC, I think. So that, is, that gives you a smaller uh, communication complexity, but a larger computation complexity, because you have to do all these operations uh, in the exponent. So that gives you lots of uh, public key operations that you have to do. We only need symmetric key operations. Uh, there's, uh, uh, in parallel to our work, um, there was also some work by, uh, by by Zeiler at all, this. and uh, so there's some other works by Vadim that improve uh, their techniques of of um, of this Fiatchamir um, with the boards to give you a better efficiency there. Um, so those are uh, more efficient in terms of communication complexity, but there, so as far as I know, no implementations are out yet. So we don't know how it compares in terms of computation. Okay, thank you. So I think I give the, the word to Amkan to present the next talk. Uh, thank you, Carla, and thank you, Karsten, for the good uh, talk. Uh, next is uh, basically Carla's paper, Updatable Inner Product Argument with Logarithmic Verifier and Applications. And my guess is Alexandros is going to be the speaker, or Carla, are you going to be the speaker? No, no, Alexandros. Is going okay, to be all right, so I'm going to hand it. It's not basically my paper. Oh, my apologies. Uh, hi. <laughs> right. So I'm, I'm gonna mute myself. All right, Alexander, to you. Uh, hi. Uh, so I will be present our work, updatable linear product argument with logarithmic verifier and applications. This is joint work with uh, Vanessa Data and uh, Carla. So first of all, uh, let me introduce very briefly non-interactive zero knowledge arguments. So we have the prover and the verifier and they, they share a common reference string, which uh, we assume to be trusted. And the prover claims it knows a witness for a statement X belonging to an NP language uh, L. So the prover sends a static proof and the verifier runs some uh, tests on it. And if the test passes, then it is convinced that uh, indeed the prover knows the witness. And we want three main properties. So completeness, which means that honest proof verifies Knowledge soundness, which means that it, it's essentially infeasible to construct uh, proofs that verify without the witness. And zero knowledge, which captures that uh, the verifier learns nothing uh, apart from the fact that the prover knows the, um, the witness. Also, additionally, one nice property we want is that the proof should be sublinear in the, in the witness size. 
But uh, the bad thing is, as we know, there are no trusted parties in the real world. So it remains this issue of how to instantiate this CRS in a way that uh, we, we guarantee these properties uh, hold. So in uh, a standard technique to do that is uh, use multi-party computation uh, techniques. So in the traditional setting, a set of parties exchange uh, messages and after a number of rounds, they collectively output uh, a common reference string. And uh, we just need the guarantee that at least one of them is, uh, is behaving honestly. But the bad news is that uh, in many senses, this, uh, this process is very expensive and difficult to, to, to make. Uh, and also this uh, CRS is uh, uh, need to be run for every language we want to a system, uh, an ASIC uh, system for. So in the growth uh, in Crypto18 presented an uh, alternative MPC, the universal and updatable model, where essentially each party creates, uh, takes a previous CRS from another party and creates a new one. And it gives a proof that essentially guarantees that the randomness contributed by previous parties uh, is taken into account. So this is much easier to introduce and it's also universal which means that uh, we need to run this setup once and instantiate any circuit of uh, bounded size. So, okay, this is the current state of the art in uh, the updatable model. So we omit here the growth uh, construction, which has a quadratic prover. So the current construction have a quasi-linear uh, prover, constant uh, proof size, and they rely on the random oracle and either the algebraic group model or some knowledge type assumption. Uh, in this work, we present two variations which uh, rely on the random oracle, but uh, more standard assumptions. So the one relies on the discrete logarithm assumption on asymmetric groups and the other on uh, a Q-variant of, of this assumption. But we sacrifice the optimal uh, constant proof size for a logarithmic one. And now the, the main tool we, we use to achieve that is to parameterize the, the way we sample keys in the in the standard Peterson vector commitment uh, scheme. So what we do is to commit to a vector of, uh, of dimension n, we sample logarithmic elements. So I, I am presenting here an example where uh, we, we need to commit to vectors of dimension eight. So we sample three elements and we, we iterate to create the key uh, as follows. So we first have the generator and in each iteration, we take what we had before and we exponentiate it to xi. So this is how this uh, process goes. So we now have a nice uh, recursive structure that we take advantage of. And the nice thing is that uh, doing it, we can, uh, being in the bilinear group setting, we can encode uh, the trapdoor x1, x2, x3 in uh, group two, which allow us to, to have succinct statement about commitments. So the prover can now state a succinct statement that it knows an opening uh, with respect to the succinct key. Uh, which is uh, the encoding in group two, such that it, uh, it has some, uh, some properties. And now having this, so to, to build the music argument, ah, uh, also it's, it's kind of easy to see that this commitment key is uh, updatable. So we essentially need to uh, multiply one key with, uh, uh, with a new one, which we create, and we just need to give some uh, discrete logarithm uh, proof of knowledge, so it's efficiently updatable. So to, to build an ESIC, uh, our starting point is the BCC et al. construction, which was later improved uh, concretely in bullet proofs. So in this construction, uh, very intuitively, we start with an arithmetic uh, circuit, which we translate to a set of constraints. And now combining with a Peterson commitment uh, key and some random challenge for the verifier, this is reduced to a statement that uh, alpha and beta z, alpha and beta are commitments, and the prover claims that it knows openings A and B such that they satisfy an inner product uh, relation. And uh, also this does not need to be zero knowledge. So the way this is handled is uh, the prover and the verifier proceed in a protocol where they reduce this to a statement for the same language, but uh, with uh, let's say half size. So this can be repeated and uh, user caution and uh, after a logarithmic number of rounds, we get uh, a constant statement and the prover can just reveal the witness since we do not care about zero knowledge at, uh, at this stage. And uh, the bad thing here is that uh, the verifier is linear. Now when combined with, uh, with this parameterized Peterson commitment and uh, this, this recursive structure in the inner product protocol 
and the commitment key, uh, it integrates well, and it allows to reduce the verification time uh, from uh, linear to logarithmic. And so this is the heart of the protocol and uh, dealing with some other technical issues, we managed to, to create uh, music, which is updatable since the, essentially the universal uh, CRS is the commitment key, which can be shown to be efficiently updatable. And uh, that's it, thank you very much. All right, thank you, Alexander. Uh, I don't see any raised hands or any chat messages. So it doesn't look like there are any questions. I did have one question actually. So this new CRS model uh, that you said was introduced in Groth's paper. Yes. When I want to verify a proof, do I have to verify all the previous CRSs, the whole chain, or only the one from the last party? Um, yes, you, uh, you need to, from the point you trust the CRS, you need to verify all the updates after that. So, but, but the good thing is that this, is, uh, this, this needs to be done uh, once. I see. Okay, and I think Markov has a question. He raised a hand. So, Markov, do you want to ask a question? Yeah, so, so it's, a, it's also related to the update model. Mm -hmm. So, you cannot prevent, um, kind of in the model we defined, you cannot prevent the adversary of doing the last update. So, did you I mean this is sometimes prevented by having saying that there's a random beacon that you use to do a public update? But if you don't have that, then you have to kind of prove your, your primitive secure against such a biased. Um, set up and that so do you do that and that is one question the other one is like is there a kind of a generic way of doing that for for many different primitives but because this seems like an additional has like a step that you, one has to do when using that model uh, th this is not a problem actually because uh, when you do an update you you give a proof that you updated correctly so even if the adversary does the last update if it's proof verifies and uh, we accept the crs the, the properties that we want, so soundness especially, uh, knowledge soundness, uh, still holds. So okay, uh, but you have to prove that bigger. I agree that it's not a problem, but uh, the, the reference string, the final reference string may, may be biased by the adversary. He may kind of make some cert certain bits of that string kind of, he may fix them and so on. Yes, yes, but since every party contributes with its randomness and we actually prove that this randomness is, uh, is taken into account, this, this does not cause any Problem with, uh, Thanks. Okay, cool. Markov, can you unraise your hand, uh, lower your hand? And uh, I don't see any other questions, so I'm going to hand it over to Carla for the next speaker. Okay. Um, yeah, well, just one comment about Markov's question. I think this is, um, I maybe I should have thought about this, but I would say. Um, probably in, in most of these cases, what, all you need is that uh, the discrete logarithm, you, you really are using a very weak property of the scheme because you're, it's only it has to be just binding. So even some, probably some kind of bias would be, would be okay, I, I would say. I mean, it's just some, okay. So we now move to the next speaker, um, which is gonna be Miguel Ambrona. This is a joint work with Masu Masayuki Abe and Miyako Okubo, and uh, from NTT, well, the affiliation is too complicated for me, um, Secure Platform Laboratories, or well, you, you can clarify. Anyway, the title of the talk is on black box extensions of non-interactive zero-knowledge arguments and signatures directly from simulation soundness. So go on, Miguel. Okay, thank you, Carla. So, Okay, my colleagues made a uh, good job explaining this, but I have, I have some slide for it. So in a non-interactive zero knowledge argument system, the prover wants to convince the verifier of the fact that certain X is in the language induced by a relation. By the way, I don't know if you can see this uh, screen of faces. Can you see my mouse? Okay, okay. So yes, we can. I can. I could see it. Yeah. Okay. So in because it's non-interactive, the prover will send one single message to the verifier, and we are going to focus on the common reference string model as the previous work, where there is a common reference string that both parties have, and they use it either in the proof algorithm or the verification algorithm. So uh, the the system must satisfy three properties, which have already been explained in other talks. And here we focus on uh, 
on a different notion of soundness, which is called unbounded simulation soundness, which uses this algorithm defined for the zero knowledge, the proof simulation algorithm. So roughly unbounded simulation soundness says that it is hard to prove a false statement even in the presence of simulated proofs. So this actually implies non-malleability. And the way to achieve simula simulation soundness in the literature is to combine the original NISC with some other primitive, so sometimes a signature or a commitment scheme, but it's always a signature-like primitive. And we wonder whether this is necessary or it can be done in a different way. And in order to answer to this question, or, or at least uh, uh, bring new insights to this question, uh, we ask whether we can build a, a signature from every USS NISC. So can we? Well, of course we can, because NISCs imply one-way functions, and one-way functions imply signatures. But can we do it with similar computation and space complexity? And there are some works that explore this idea, but they all require the NISC be expressive enough. So it doesn't work for all NISCs. The, the NISC, NISC system needs to satisfy a certain level of expressivity. So we, we, we have now to answer to two questions. One of them is, can we generally um, modify and increase the expressivity of a NISC in what we call a black box language extension? And second, if not, uh, can we build a signature scheme direct, directly from every USS NISC? And those are the questions that we try to answer in this work. So first of all, let me explain what the language extension is. So let's consider the disjunction extension, which is basically the language made of pairs of words where either the first is in the first language or the second in the second language. And when we talk about a disjunctive extension, we think of the existence of a compiler such that for any two languages and any two NISCs for those languages, builds a NISC for the, for the extension I described above. So this compiler can call the underlying functions of these systems in a black box way, but it doesn't care about how they are implemented. And the, the compiler also doesn't care about how the languages are implemented. So in this work, we, we have several impossibility results. So one of them is that conjunctive e extension is impossible if you want to preserve the unbounded simulation soundness property. Notice that if you don't care about this property, it's, it's possible with parallel execution. But our proof of impossibility has a, a side condition, which is a, what we call the full verification model. Namely, we only um, prove impossibility of compilers such that all the, all the proofs that have been proven with the underlying provers are verified during verification. Another impossibility result is this disjunctive composition. Even if you, if you give up, give up uh, properties like simulation soundness. And this, is, uh, this has the side condition that uh, the, the languages must be hard for the scheme to, to be impossible to, to extend. And the way we prove this is in the style of Impagliazzo and Rudig, where we define an oracle that is sufficient to construct a language and an ISC for that language. However, any candidate compiler cannot be an ISC for the extended language. And the way we prove this is we assume the compiler gives you a system that is zero knowledge, and then we can prove that uh, soundness must be compromised or unbounded simulation soundness in, in the case of the conjunctive composition. So to conclude, let me, let me summarize how the signature scheme that we propose from every USS NISC works. So basically we are gonna map messages into false statements and a signature is gonna be just a simulated proof of that false statement. And notice that the unbounded simulation soundness game becomes the existential unforgeability game for the signature. So that's why this scheme is secure. However, there are several subtleties that need to be handled. So first of all is how can we map messages into false statements, arbitrary messages into false statements and a second question is, why is this scheme correct? So why do simulated proofs on false statements um, are, must be accepting? Well, I refer to the paper for those details. So just let me conclude. So in this paper, we have considered uh, the question of why upgrades from NISC to USS NISC use signature-like primitives. I hope we brought new insights um, to explain this. 
And also we have proposed uh, several impossibility results that suggest that in order to achieve general expressivity of NISCs under new assumptions, you're gonna have to, to make extra effort. So that's, that's it, thank you for listening. Okay, thank you, Miguel. Um, I also don't see um, any raised hands. Well, um, not, I'd be happy, I'd yeah, be happy not, to ask a question ah, or somebody Go else. ahead, yeah. Uh, yeah, so you mentioned that you have a black box separation for the NIZK and there's the sort of the usual issue uh, with black box separations like this, that the NIZK allows you to do things in a non-black box way, right? You can uh, uh, sort of, come up with proof that are respective to statements that depend on the Oracle. I was just wondering how you get around it in this uh, in this context, or maybe why it doesn't come up in this context. Yeah, so basically the way we do it is uh, we model the language also with an Oracle. So, so when, when you see our impossibility results, you may think of a compiler that is just an ISC for, um, for an NP complete language and completely ignores the implementation of the underlying NISCs and just use the Cook reduction to implement the, the language you're interested in. But that is not satisfying to, to answer to our questions of uh, why, for example, why signature-like primitives are, are used to, to achieve simulation soundness because you are, you are completely ignoring the underlying primitive. So the way, the way you can capture the underlying primitive is by handling the the, oracle, the language as an oracle, and I think that that's also maybe answers to your question. So we we model the language with an oracle, so you cannot just uh, ignore the underlying primitives. I see. So it's not like a general uh, disk for all of NP or something like this. Okay. Thanks. Okay. Um... I would also like to ask a question. So um, in this general um, transformation to, to a signature scheme, you map to this false statement, so which is like a technique that has been used like uh, in practice for. Um, and I'm, I think it's, it's interesting that the, mm, so how you do this generally? Like, because I mean, the point is to do a generic construction. Doesn't it depend on the language? Yeah, yeah, you're right. So first of all, our construction is not, uh, completely general. It's only for languages that are hard. So if the NISC is defined for a language that is hard, as def usually defined in crypto. So hard language is such that there exists two samplers, one that only produces true, two true statements, the other only produces false statements. And still the output of these two sample samplers is indistinguishable. So our construction is only for schemes that, that are hard in this sense. However, first of all, notice that it's not clear why NISCs for languages that are not hard make sense, mm -hmm. possibly. And second of all, we don't know of any language that doesn't satisfy this condition. So Okay, because yeah. actually this is related to um, another question that I had is like, um, so you give these impossibility results and, and so for extending these languages in a um, black box way, but I was wondering if there is interesting practical cases where you don't know how to extend the language. Just, you know what I mean? Like a yes, concrete- Maybe in some, under some new, new settings, for example, in isogeny based crypto, I don't know what the state, I'm not sure about what the state of the art is right now, but uh, yeah, under new settings, you, you have to build a, a NISC for NP complete language from scratch. Okay, so, I think uh, we use some time for questions, so we move on to the next talk, Omkan. Yeah, sounds good. I think Markov also had a question, but he will ask it later in the interest of time. Let's keep moving. So the next ah, talk- Ah, sorry, is... Markov. No, it's fine. I think we should keep moving because we can ask this later. Um, so the next uh, paper is on QA NISIC in the BPK model um, by Behzad Abdul Maliki, Halgor Litma, Jan Osim, uh, Michael Zizak and Behzad will give the talk. So it's to Behzad now. Okay, thank you so much for the introduction. Uh, I will start with the quasi, with the, with the definition of quasi-adaptive NISIC, which is a variant of the NIS in the CRS model, where the, where the CRS depends to some language parameter L part in a way that uh, L part is the honestly generated first and then 
uh, given L par, a CRS generator can generate the CRS and share this to the party and prove or use it to generate the proof to give us some uh, proof of validity of some statement and verify or use it to, the, to either accept or reject the proof. The same as NISIC, such construction should satisfy the following properties completeness, which says that for a valid X, we should accept the proof. So soundness is the opposite and says that uh, for an invalid X, a cheating uh, prover should not be able to convince the verifier. And finally, the zero knowledge says that P should not leak any information of the witness more than the fact that X is, the, is, in, the, is in the language to the verifier. And quasi uh, 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 has been used in uh, uh, constructing commitment scheme ID signature, and recently they got attention to, to the SNARK construction and also shuffle arguments about the history of the Quanisic. It's, it's first started, it's first in introduced by Roy and Yutla in 2017. Uh, for a for a linear language and then ended by the KLC, KLC and V in the Yoclip system that gave a most efficient quantization uh, for the linear language or subspace language. Uh, in 2016, uh, Pelare, Fuchsbauer, and Eskafura uh, uh, studied music in a uh, in an untrusted setup. Uh, and they they defined a new security notion. It's called subversion security, or more more precisely, they define subversion ZK and subversion sound. With subversion ZK says says that ZK holds even CRS creator is malicious, and sound says that sound is false even CRS creator is malicious. And they also propose some possibility and impossibility result in this issue. And the most important one is that. Having uh, simultaneous subversion soundness and subversion ZK is, in, is impossible. But another interesting uh, result is that uh, having soundness but subversion ZK is impossible. Where we in 2017 and also in a different work, uh, Fuchsbauer in 2018 proposed a version of SNARK, which is sound and subversion ZK. And in this work, we are going to deal with uh, to see. Uh, to study quantity in such a setting, I mean, uh, uh, what happens if uh, prover does not trust to the CRS generator, and what happens to the soundness, for example, if we assume that the language parameter in the quantity is generated maliciously. We first uh, uh, investigate a, a variant of the bare public key model where verifier generates the public key and registers it to some uh, some data here that you can think it as a bulletin board that only trusted to store, not to change, and then prove a Reddit and uh, start to generate proof and etc. And then, uh, as, a, as a reminding, in the subversion TK setting, we see that prover does not trust to the CRS generator, so CRS generator and verifier can be only one party, and we observe that sub. Subversion ZK in the CRS model is equivalent to the ZK in the bare public key model. And later, we defined quantity in the bare public key model and, uh, uh, and says that uh, such constructions should, should satisfy the following properties, completeness, which is the same as before. And we defined a new notion of security called subpart soundness, subversion parameter soundness, where soundness holds even language parameter is generated and public key is honest generated. And the, an, another new notion is called persistent ZK, where uh, it says that ZK holds even language parameter are public key are maliciously generated. And at the end, the, uh, zero knowledge is, is the same as before. And we say that this is sub ZK equals persistent ZK and ZK holds. And finally, we, we, we define a kill sequence in the paid public key model in a way that we define the public parameter PKB that gets a, as the input language parameter row and public key and, uh, uh, and checks if it's well formed, which is guaranteed that there exists some secret TSP for the public key, which is crucial for, for, for proving per, persistent ZK. And we prove it under some non possible non assumption which is a new assumption we call the KWKE, which is kids the knowledge assumption. And also we prove uh, that this is sub uh, part soundness under a variant of kernel uh, MDDH. And at the end also we prove uh, a stronger notion of soundness called sub part knowledge sound under uh, a, a variant of the SDL 
uh, PL assumption. So, yeah, thank you so much. All right, thanks, yeah. thanks Bezad. I don't see any raised hands or any questions in the chat. So I'll ask one. So why does, so you define persistent zero knowledge and zero knowledge separately. So it's unclear to me why persistent zero knowledge does not imply the zero knowledge. Oh. Why, do you, why do you need the additional property? Oh, okay. Uh, I would say that, uh, you know, at the first side, you might think that if, if a protocol is persistent ZK, so for sure it is ZK, but I would say that, uh, you know, you should, uh, I would note that a standard ZK uh, in, a, in, a, in a standard ZK, we assume that there is a trusted party who generates the, the trapdoor and, and the simulator is given this trapdoor can simulate the proof. Uh, but in persistent ZK, this is relied on some non falsified assumption and the and so this is more uh, stronger than uh, a standard ZK. And uh, in the paper, we also gave a counter example. We called it uh, leaky coins, where uh, CRS, for example, is where we don't have any element in the CRS, and CRS is empty. But, and also proof uh, is only witness uh, in exponent. So in that case, I mean, this is not ZK. Why? Because there is no trapdoor and simulator cannot simulate the proof, but it could be persistent ZK. Why? Because this is because under some knowledge assumption, one can extract the language parameter and then I mean and and then simulate the proof uh, by having the word. So yeah. Okay. So the way I understand it is, you're saying persistent ZK does imply ZK, but it's a question of the assumption, because persistent ZK is harder to get. So you will get it under some weird assumption, whereas um, standard ZK you could hope you can get basically under standard assumptions. So you can yeah. live with you can live with persistent ZK as being your basic zero knowledge property, but then you will you will be living with uh, a, a bad assumption or uh, not a bad uh, assumption, uh, but non-falsible assumption. Yeah, let's yeah, say yeah. non-falsible. Yeah. Okay. 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 And if I wanted, let's say instead of zero knowledge, let's say I wanted witness indistinguishability, like non-interactive witness indistinguishability. Could you do better? Because now you don't have to rely, you don't have, need a, need a, need a trap door, so. Uh, uh, you mean? Uh, uh, like, the, subversion resistant WI. Uh, I would say that there is uh, already some construction for the, for the NISIG, I guess with Cook's power et al, that they investigated this, uh, I mean, this impossibility tables, and you mean that having a uh, witness, I mean, you know, based on this table, we could have, for example, subversion sound and witness indistinguishability. So having, I mean, subversion sound, ZK is impossible, but I mean, for the witness indistinguishability, we only could have soundness and subversion sound. So if you mean these two cases, I would say that there is already a construction for the easy by okay. that they studied that. Okay. Okay, good. Um, I don't have any other questions and I don't see any other questions. So I'm gonna turn it over to Carla who will introduce the next speaker. Sorry. So um, now we're, we're moving to the next talk um, where Svika Brakerski will, from Weizmann will be giving the talk. It's joint work with Yael Tauman Kalai from Microsoft and MIT. And the talk is on witness indistinguishability for any single round argument with applications to access control. So, go. Um, Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, so this, this work is in the context of succinct NP delegation. So what this means is that we have a verifier that wants to uh, certify the validity of a certain NP statement X. And it wants to use the power of a prover that has a witness for this NP statement. But the point is that the verifier wants to have communication, computational complexity that are much, much smaller than the size of the, the length of the witness. Uh, so the communication pattern that we consider is a two message protocol with computational soundness, such that the verifier first sends a first message, which is a query, and then the prover responds with an answer that should allow the verifier to certify the validity, the validity of the statement. Uh, so this is a succinct NP delegation. And uh, in the random Oracle model or under knowledge assumptions, you can actually get these things with uh, sort of almost optimal parameters or practical optimal parameters in, in many um, 
uh, many parameters that you consider. And in the standard model, under standard assumptions, you only have limited results for limited classes of NP, uh, of NP languages. And in this work, what we consider is the privacy of the prover in this type of arguments. In particular, what we show is that we can add witness indistinguishability generically to, to every such argument. So the verifier cannot tell which witness the prover is using in order to prove the statement. Um, more specifically, we have two results in the paper. One is this generic witness indistinguishability transformation. And the price that you pay for this witness indistinguishability is an additive uh, overhead in the computational complexity and communication complexity, which is polynomial in the complexity of the original verifier, of the original proof system, which also needs to be super polynomially secure. And then we have an application. We present a primitive that we call an access control scheme. And this is somewhat related to the um, primitive known as anonymous credentials. And we show how to construct this primitive. The underlying assumptions for all these things, um, the primitives that we use can be instantiated under the super polynomial hardness of learning with errors or DDH or decisional composite residuosity or quadratic residuosity. residuosity. So it's a variety of assumptions. Let's go into a little more details and talk about our generic witness indistinguishability transformation. So the idea is that rather, for the, rather than the prover sending the response A uh, in the clear, it's going to send a commitment to A and the witness indistinguishable proof that indeed the contents of the commitments would satisfy the verifier. And uh, this, uh, this would preserve soundness uh, because a soundness proof would just sort of brute force break the commitment and extract the value A, which is guaranteed to satisfy the verifier. And uh, this is going to give you uh, uh, an adversary against the, original, uh, against the original system. And the witness indistinguishability guarantees witness indistinguishability. So uh, this is uh, sort of the general outline, but there are some subtleties. So for example, the verifier might need secret information uh, in order to verify the statement. Uh, so therefore the prover is not going to know what, uh, what to prove, what statement to prove in this, in witness indistinguish in this witness indistinguishable part. Uh, and the second one is that the standard notion of witness indistinguishability is insufficient for what we need for this, uh, for this type of argument. So let's start with the first uh, uh, with the, this uh, first subtlety. So if the verifier actually needs uh, a secret key in order to verify the statement, uh, then what we do is essentially, essentially or uh, um, intuitively use uh, some notion of fully homomorphic encryption. And the verifier is going to send an encryption of the secret key to the prover. And the prover is essentially going to do everything under the fully homomorphic encryption. This fully homomorphic encryption needs to be malicious circuit private. And uh, as we discussed, as I discussed with you only recently, there's more than one way to actually do this. Um, but essentially you do things under the homomorphic encryption and, uh, and prove with respect to the homomorphic encryption. Uh, and you can even notice that you don't actually need the compactness property of fully homomorphic encryption. You can, either, you can also get a solution based on uh, maliciously secure oblivious transfer and garbled circuits. So this gives you a wider variety of assumptions that you can, that you can rely on. The second issue is the witness indistinguishable proof system. And what we need is witness indistinguishable proof system that work even when every, every instance only has one valid witness. And this notion of strong witness indistinguishability actually allow, allows you to do this. Strong witness indistinguishability guarantees witness indistinguishability, even uh, in the case where you have two distributions of witnesses and uh, uh, of instances and witnesses, so long as distributions of instances is computationally indistinguishable, then you get uh, witness indistinguishability, even if for each instance by itself, there's only uh, one witness. And indeed, there's previous works that constructed the strong witness indistinguishability for all of NP uh, under, the assumptions, under the assumptions that we need. Lastly, we construct these access control, uh, these access control schemes, and essentially we build them uh, from three components. One is batch NP delegation. So these are these limited uh, NP dele succinct NP delegation schemes that I mentioned before. And these are schemes for languages that sort of contain a bunch of small NP witnesses and some aggregator function that, that combines them together. So for those, we have succinct NP witnesses. And then we put our witness indistinguishable, uh, witness indistinguishable transformation on top of that. Uh, so we get a uh, witness indistinguishable proof system for these languages. And then um, combining that with the standard signature schemes and random tags, we get this notion of, uh, of uh, anonymous access control schemes. And this is more or less it. Thank you. Thank you, Tsvika. Um, um, I don't see any raised hands. Um, I'll ask a question, actually, if that's OK. Yeah. Yeah, because I don't see how to raise my hand as a co-host. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, so as we got the, uh, it's a very simple question. If you look at a proof technique, then because you want it to be a generic transformation, you really have to extract A. There is no other choice. And as a result, you really have to make your assumption uh, super poly, right? Right. But maybe you could consider, I don't know if you have already thought about it. Maybe there is a simpler class of transformations where you only look at verifiers which do certain kinds of computations, like maybe only linear computations, right? And then maybe you don't have to reduce the soundness to the soundness of the original proof system. So then you don't have to extract A, 
but maybe you could do you could reduce it to some other assumption so oh, you, uh, well if you don't use uh, well but this means that you don't use the the original verifier as a black box right if you want to do a reduction then yeah, yeah. Uh, and at least if it's a black box reduction right then i would need to sort of present a cheating prover against the original scheme so you're saying yes. this maybe for specific for specific proof systems you can do like sort of uh, more efficient uh I guess this is what you're saying, right? The verifier yeah. is not going to be a, a general thing, but you know sort of what the verifier is doing, and then maybe you can apply this without uh, without uh, super problem hurdles. Yeah, I mean uh, that that seems uh, that seems reasonable. And actually, I think um, uh, this is something that you can think even even not for witness and exclusion, even just to get better delegation schemes. And and I think uh, you no know, Yale and some co-authors actually sort of work in this direction and get some some nice uh, delegation, some nice results on delegation, sort of by considering specific proof system. I see. Okay, cool. Okay, so um, I think we we will move on to the next talk because I see no more questions. All right, so the next talk is on boosting verifiable computation on encrypted data by Dario Fior, Anka Nichulescu, and David Poinchoa. And I think Anka will give the talk. So to Anka. Yeah, thank you for the introduction. So uh, this is our work on boosting verifiable computation and encrypted data. Um, and uh, I will just start with um, a brief uh, context. So we are um, in this setting of a delegation of computation. A client delegates uh, some data uh, and the computation of an algorithm F on this data to some server that applies the, um, the algorithm and sends back just the result here. Um, so this can be useful in many contexts. I uh, picked one like biometric surveillance system here. And the requirements will be um, to um, guarantee um, the data privacy uh, with respect to the server that can be malicious and also um, to have some um, possibility to check the integrity of this result uh, the client gets back. So we have um, protocols and schemes in cryptography that uh, help us uh, do uh, solve both of these solutions, but turns out that combining uh, techniques from um, data privacy and computation integrity um, just results in a very inefficient scheme. So if we just decide to um, uh, use a fully homomorphic encryption scheme to encrypt the data, delegate the computation on this uh, ciphertext to the server, receive the result, and um, uh, compute a proof of the integrity of this evaluation on a ciphertext, this is very inefficient. And some works were done to improve the um, practical efficiency of those schemes. And one of them is uh, Fiore, Gennaro, and Passo, who proves efficient the verifier computation, but only for uh, quadratic functions uh, with privacy for the inputs. And uh, their scheme is inherently uh, designated verifier. So we want to improve on this. And our result will achieve public verifiable schemes where we separate the client who encrypts the inputs of the computation from the verifier who can learn the result of the computation and check the integrity of this evaluation, but uh, cannot learn anything about the inputs. So the inputs are private with respect to the verifier. And also we achieve uh, com uh, proving computation for uh, higher degree functions, not only quadratic functions. So we uh, start with arithmetic circuits uh, of some bounded multiplicative uh, depth. So our idea is to look at the specific structure of uh, ciphertext in uh, fully homomorphic encryption schemes. And um, we look at um, schemes that use polynomials in this ring RQ, defined uh, usually like that, for um, R of X of degree D. So here the computation are expressed as operation, like a circuit, but with operation over polynomials. We have uh, polynomial addition, polynomial multiplication. And the uh, overhead of generating a proof about such a computation is significantly larger than just computing on, on plain text. Computing on plain text means um, uh, just uh, applying the same uh, dimension circuit, but with gates over, uh, over scalars, right? And we like to translate this into what we know to prove for now. So we translate every gate over polynomial into gates over its coefficients, so over scalars, but we uh, have this dependency of the degree of the polynomial. So this is the overhead for the proof generation. We'll be, we will have to prove a computation over a circuit, which is huge compared to what we will have to prove on a plain text without privacy. So in our work, we find a way to um, reduce this overhead and uh, minimize the dependence on the degree D of polynomials. And this is 
by exploiting some nice homomorphic property of uh, just evaluating polynomials in a random point, which is hidden from the, from the proof. So we compress this circuit here over polynomial by evaluating all the inputs in some random point and we um, describing a circuit here that is exactly the same we have in the left, but with gates that are computed on uh, scalars, so over ZQ. So the prover now will have to compute um, to generate a proof for some computation uh, that is exactly as the one, as, as large as the one on clear text. So the overhead of computing of ciphertext is not seen in the proof. But of course, uh, this doesn't um, uh, guarantee, convince any verifier that the circuit here has some link with the original computation the prover actually did on ciphertext. And this link um, is exactly the evaluation of random point K. And we have to add this to the proof in order to convince a verifier that this, but this overhead is just degree D times number of inputs. So it's the best we can hope because the prover has to read the input, right? Um, and uh, a little more into details of uh, our solution, we use the commit and proof methodology and we uh, commit to com compactly commit to the inputs here in the circuit of over polynomials and compactly commit over the scalars and prove there is a connection between those sets of commitments. And the connection is that um, the evaluation of what's committed uh, here of those polynomials are exactly the scalars that we input to the second circuit. So we need a proof here for the evaluation of some polynomials and then just use an efficient proof uh, commit and prove uh, SNARK, for example, for evaluation of arithmetic circuit over integers, right? Um, so our, our main contribution is a proof for many simultaneous evaluation over, uh, over these uh, polynomials. And then we will combine it with another proof uh, for, uh, for an arithmetic circuit. And this is possible uh, uh, thanks to this work of Campanelli and all that defines Lego scenarios who allow us to reuse some commitments in different proofs. So just to wrap up, um, we have uh, an efficient verification computation uh, with privacy of the inputs with respect to the verifier. We compactly commit to the input to ciphertext and this um, ensures hiding with respect to the verifier who has the decryption key. And uh, we are able to reduce the proof of um, computing over uh, ciphertext to a proof equivalent almost as efficient as computing over uh, clear text. So this is the overview of my uh, construction and I would be happy to take a question now. Okay, so I have two people, I think. So there are two people who are raising hands. Uh, I think Karim is the first one. Karim, do you wanna go first? I think this, I, I raised my hand in previous talk. Sorry. So, yeah. Okay. Um, a question for this time. Well, there's also a question by Markov in the chat. Okay, and I, think... I asked first. I think there's a chance to discuss, to ask questions on previous talks, maybe if there's time. Let's see. So yeah, my yeah, question yeah. is, so given that you evaluate the polynomial on a random point, is it necessary to keep that random evaluation private? Or could you do with a, with a snark that is not zero knowledge? So I, I, maybe I didn't understand all the details, but... If you uh, add some extra randomness to the polynomial, maybe that would work. So the problem is when uh, each time we um, reveal an evaluation uh, of some polynomial, we have some information, right? Because uh, if we have enough evaluation, we just reinterpolate the polynomial and get the roots. So um, we want to avoid this because we want uh, zero knowledge for the um, overall construction, composing these two uh, proofs through sigma and pi. So this is why we cannot afford to open evaluation to the polynomial, even if we randomize the polynomial, because uh, mm -hmm. we will learn something about the roots of these polynomials, which... Okay. That's interesting. Thanks. All right, Karim, do you want to ask now? You're muted, so if you're speaking, we can't hear you. Uh, if not, then there were some other questions. There was a question for Alexandros by Abbas, which I missed. It was in the chat. Um, he asks if you said, what do you suggest to continue working on as a follow up to your uh, to your talk? I, I find very interesting. The, so in all uh, Mesics with uh, with a universal setup, 
which can in some say any circuit. I find very interesting uh, how to a very interesting problem how to do that uh, efficiently. So either by making some uniformity assumption on the circuits you can uh, prove instead of straightforwardly working with uh, ArcNet circuits or finding things to make this uh, usually these parts involve some delegation to the prover which uh, uh, can be the bottleneck at least in the recent construction so I think it's a nice uh, thing to improve on and think on. Cool. Karim, I see that you have raised your hand again. So if you're not having technical difficulty, go ahead. And if you are, then maybe you can just type your question and I can read it for everybody. Okay. Okay, so we have a few minutes for a general discussion. Um, Could I ask another question to Anka? Anka, do you think your techniques, I mean, your techniques, um, seem maybe quite general, no? Maybe, do you think they can they can be of utility in other protocols beyond what you... Yeah, like we, we claim that um, this, um, com like uh, generating proofs for computation over polynomials can be used uh, in other contexts, right? And a lot of recent SNARKs, I guess, they use these uh, um, polynomial commitments so um, our advantage is that we never open the evaluation of the commitments. So we get some extra privacy um, with respect to these evaluation uh, points, which um, previous work on polynomial commitment don't get. I don't know if they need it in other construction or this can be, but yeah, I, I think there are other application that we can find for our scheme of uh, this uh, polynomial evaluation. Actually, this, I mean, maybe Markov can comment on this, but this seems like a problem, right? That you don't give the evaluation in the way they usually normally use the polynomial commitments. Depends on the application. So mm -hmm. in many applications, it's not a problem because you kind of make the commitments hiding by adding extra randomness. That was, so it's related yeah. to my previous question, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, I have another question on the talk on simulation soundness and the relation to signatures. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, so I was wondering, there's also the notion of simulation extractability, which you can use to build signatures quite easily by just proving knowledge of the secret key. So I was wondering what's the connection there and the, kind of the hardness of the language seems to be a decisional problem, right? You cannot distinguish um, two from false statements while kind of getting the secret key from the public key is a Kind of a computational notion. So, is what what is the the connection between these two ways of building signatures? Have you thought about it? I think that's for Miguel, right? Miguel, yeah. Was giving the talk. Yeah. So I haven't thought about it. So can can you repeat the question? What do you mean by decisional? What so simulation extraction allows you is is kind of the notion that you can extract even though they are simulated um, proofs for 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 two statements. And then this, the way you, you build a signature scheme from that is that you, you prove knowledge of the secret key in a way that also binds it to the message. And then if there's a forgery, then you can extract the secret key and you do a reduction to the fact that this is, mm -hmm. it's hard to compute the secret key from the public key. Yeah, so may, maybe we are citing one work that uses that notion, but don't you require some uh, certain expressivity on the NISC? You need to be able to handle that relation that you, you just mentioned. Yes, you need to. Uh, yeah, actually, if I can add something to it. So as far as my understanding goes about simulation extractability, it's going to imply simulation soundness. Okay. Mm -hmm. so, yeah. so if they are ruling out simulation soundness, it's also going to rule out simulation extractability. No, but he's not uh, asking about the impossibility, but the signature construction, if I understood correctly. He yeah, so it's kind of it's, it's a different construction, and um, may, maybe so. Your 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 hardness assumption is a decisional assumption, it kind of right. Yeah. Uh, so so can you build it from a computational assumption? But so that that's kind of what I was a bit confused about. Yeah, we haven't thought about that. But I was saying um, doing it from from those works that assume uh, sim uh, simulation extractability. May, may not be as general as we want. Mm -hmm. in, in terms of a NISC expressivity, you, you are restricted to NISCs 
that have that explicitity. But I haven't thought about that. Maybe we can talk about it later on. That's good. Mm -hmm. Actually, I do have a follow-up, Miguel. Uh, I think I was looking at your talk, the, the longer version. And I think you mentioned in that talk uh, that there are some limitations to your lower bound. For example, you have to assume that the verifier, all, all the proofs that you generate, you need to be able to query the verifier, right? I was yes, wondering that's if- in one of the impossibilities. Right, right. So how, fund how fundamental is, is it? I mean, does it, do you see it as just a barrier for proof technique or is it? It's actually a technicality in our proof technique. Mm -hmm. So actually one of the reviewers pointed out that it may be interesting to, to avoid that limitation. It's, it's a limitation of our technique, but think about it. So why, why, why is it not uh, reasonable? Can you think of a scheme that proves something and then doesn't use it? But definitely it's, it's a limitation of our technique. Right, but I think but it, I, I, one of the two proofs for the conjunction right. one. Yeah, I see. I mean, but you require that when you generate the proof, you also verify it, right? Is that the condition? Is that the correct? That the proofs that are, so during the main proving algorithm, you may call the underlying provers. So those proofs will be used in verification. Right. So you cannot just call the prover and, and not, not include this, this in your final proof. I mean, it, it could happen that you have two proofs and somehow they are malleable and then you generate a new proof and you only include that proof in your verification. You don't include the ones that you actually queried. Yes, yes. So, um, okay. But I mean, our, compiler, our compiler cannot do that for that impossibility result. Okay. Okay. I don't have any other questions. Um, can I add something to the question I, uh, uh, I had from Mark Wolf? Uh, so I was thinking of this randomizing polynomials and why it doesn't make sense in, uh, in this application. So we, we talk about um, evaluation of uh, um, ciphertext, which are polynomials. So I guess ciphertext should still decrypt at the end. So if we just randomize those, which the polynomial will just uh, lead to something that doesn't encrypt the right thing, right? So I guess in this application, this technique of re-randomization wasn't satisfactory for us. Yeah. So I do think we are we have filled the whole hour actually. Yes. Uh, with the question. Oh, there's one more one more question by Besa. Uh, do you want to ask Besa? Uh, yeah. Actually, uh, my question uh, refers to Miguel again about this uh, simulation extractability. So. Uh, by simulation ex extractability, you mean unbounded simulation, uh, as I understood correctly. And uh, but uh, there is, I don't know if this can can cover, for example, a variant of NISC, like I mean this quasi of NISC that uh, explained it before. So can we also use such a possibility or impossibility? I mean, can we use such a result in that case? So honestly. Uh, I don't remember. I, re I remember we mentioned or we explored quasi adapti adaptive NISCs long ago, but I don't remember what the conclusion was. Uh, because, for example, by using a tool, it's called, I mean, SPG stuff, one can, uh, one can build a, a quasi adaptive NISC. But on the, on the other hand, I mean, for, for the SPG stuff, we don't have, I mean, unbounded, uh, we cannot get unbounded simulation sound over uh, the construction, I mean, the NIST construction by the SPCA. So yeah, that was very, I mean, interesting to me, whether it is, I, I mean, what is the relation between these two cases? Yeah, okay. Okay, so maybe that's a good uh, future work direction. Okay, thank you, yeah. Well. As on Kanten, I think uh, the time is uh, out, no? Like that we should uh, be heading to the next, to the social, right. what, the virtual social hour. Yeah, well, right. thanks everyone for the, for the very cool talks. And I guess I'll see you in the social hour. <laughs>